My name is Narcissus. 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 Who am I? Who am I? Who am I? Now, instead of a stream, Narcissus fell into live streams. Narcissus is a piece of interpassive fiction built with twine. Based on Ovid's myth of Narcissus. Or is just a chimeric phantom born out of nowhere but our age of the internet. Through creating textual spectacles. That are more poetic, eye-catching, or grotesque. Then I believe the monster is waiting the Zeus in the labyrinth of Crete. Or a million TikTok videos. Narcissus asks this question. How does one know thyself in the digital age? Hey, can you guys hear me? Sorry for not turning on the camera. Oh, well, you know, difficult times, huh? So, well, I first came up with the idea of Narcissus during the pandemic. When the pandemic started, I was in Berlin. And ever since we returned to campus, there's a long period of quarantine. Time feels very different in the quarantine. My partner and I, we spend most of our time aimlessly watching TV shows on Netflix, doodle jumping, looking into horoscopes, checking out news and be anxious, and then don't check out news. Entertaining ourselves with a short video app, quite like TikTok called Red. That was the spring break, and it is easy to lose track of, well, the so-called real time. The screen is in front of me. The things on it, they are dynamic, ever-changing, while everything else out of the screen is horribly static and unchanging. It is easy to get a little numb and feel that we are doing the same thing every single day. We are just repeating ourselves as if we were caught in a time loop. There comes the first inspiration of Narcissus, to capture such an experience that when virtuality becomes more overwhelming than reality. In the interpassive fiction, you will be playing the character Narcissus, exploring the spectacular online world as well as his contemplation on the spectacles. A page in the interpassive fiction of Narcissus looks like this. The screen is divided into two halves. The left half is the online world, while the right half is the contemplation of the protagonist. There is no action. Unlike other text adventure games, which are action heavy, the players are only allowed to contemplate. Thus, instead of an interactive fiction, I call it an interpassive fiction. The interpassive fiction, like the title suggested, is based on the myth of Narcissus. I've long been interested in the topic of the modernization of myth, to think about how Asian tales could be recontextualized in our modern times. Myths, since they were created, are used and recycled as symbols in literature, and many forms of other work. The myth of Narcissus itself has been retold many times. The one time that gives me the most inspiration is from Marshall McLuhan's Understanding Media, The Extensions of Men. Marshall McLuhan was a Canadian philosopher whose work focuses on media theories. There's a chapter in Understanding Media called The Gadget Lover, Narcissus as Narcosis, where McLuhan compares modern human's relationship with technology to Narcissus's relationship with the reflection in the water. He proposes that the technology is the extension of human's body and we are constantly obsessed with it. Be that as it may, the wisdom of the Narcissus myth does not convey any idea that Narcissus fell in love with anything he regarded as himself. Obviously he would have had very different feelings about the image had he known it was an extension or repetition of himself. It is, perhaps, indicative of the bias of our intensely technological and, therefore, narcotic culture that we have long interpreted the Narcissus story to mean that he fell in love with himself, that he imagined the reflection to be Narcissus. 
So, when we are talking about our relationship with ourselves, are we talking about ourselves or merely the extensions of ourselves? Is it possible to know ourselves from something that is just a repetition, an extension, or even a distorted version of them? What might be the danger of such? I want to pick up this thread of questions from ancient times and show the continuity of the query of know thyself in my piece. Another main reason I use myth is for its power of alienation. It is commonly known that sci-fi bears this kind of power. Sci-fi, if not for science fiction, but speculative fabulation, is usually considered to bear the power of taking its readers to a distant space, a distant time, that are unfamiliar and alien to them. And with a distance, one observes a quasi-reality that resembles their own reality in many aspects but differ in a lot more. The differences prompt one to inspect what is familiar to us, and what we already conceive as our own normativity critically. If sci-fi brings one to the future, then myth brings one to the past. And in Narcissus, I intend to bring the two ends of time together by setting the worldview as a sci-fi Asian Greece. What Chimeras, transplants, social media, all existing in this phantasmagoric world. And through this, we achieve the double-layered alienation effect. How is it used specifically in the piece? One thing I'm trying to invite the reader to contemplate is the pandemic we are currently living in, and how the pandemic has shaped our digital activities. In the story, I make the sci-fi parallel to our pandemic that is Athenian plague. The protagonist, narcissist like any one of us, is in a pandemic, in a quarantine where he cannot reach out to the external world but is only able to try to understand his true self through aimlessly surfing the internet, tracing his own social media accounts, taking personality quizzes, in hope of piecing up who he truly is, eye-catching ads, immeasurable amounts of hyperlinks, and all the new, lively, kaleidoscopic information online will try to lead him astray. Narcissus thinks of the plague. He thinks of it constantly. He meditates on how the plague has led him to a state of ennui, a non-continuous flow of memories and weird sensations of time. One concept that I have repeatedly brought up is the spectacle. It comes from the French theorist Guy Debord's work, The Society of the Spectacles. Guy Debord was a French Marxist theorist, philosopher, and filmmaker. And the Society of the Spectacle was one of his most well-known philosophy pieces. In this text, he presented the concept of the spectacle, which is the material reconstruction of the religious illusion, saying that in modern society, being is degraded into having, and authentic human life is degraded into representations. Remember, at the beginning of the presentation, I said that the game mechanism does not allow the player to act, but only to contemplate. The inspiration comes from the board's observation of modern society, that the modern human condition as a kind of passive identification with the spectacle supplants genuine activity. The alienation of the spectator to the profit of the contemplated object, which is the result of his own unconscious activity, is expressed in the following way. The more he contemplates, the less he lives. The more he accepts recognizing himself in the dominant images only, the less he understands his own existence and his own desires. The externality of the spectacle in relation to the active man appears in the fact that his own gestures are no longer his but those of another who represents them to him. This is why the spectator feels at home nowhere, because the spectacle is everywhere. The work influences me in many different ways, not only the game mechanism, but also the prose style of mine. I mentioned before that I intend to create textual spectacles. I've deliberately chosen to write in fragmented ways to reflect the fragmentation of information online, choosing the most colorful, weird, evocative, and intense words to try to make text this medium that is less likely to evoke a sense of spectacular become as illusion-inducing as possible. I seek inspirations from new weird novels to realize the power of simple text inducing fascination, weirdness, and fear. I created Cthulhu-like mysterious entities that act as gods in my piece, the big algos, algo as in algorithm. No one knows what they look like, they're chimerical, untouchable, and being worshipped everywhere, no matter if one knows or not. 
They are the deities of technological age that preys on the energy produced from computer-mediated transactions of human. They've only been seen once in Athens President's Tao Tao video. Yeah, that is a parody of a TikTok video. But their appearances are described using the words that you feed into the game through input boxes in the former parts of the game. To say what the big algos really are, I have to borrow the language from Shoshana Zuboff. They're Zuboff's big other, the surveillance capitalism that consists of the data extraction and analysis from the behavioral surplus the users generated and computer-mediated abilities, including expected and often illegible mechanisms of extraction, commodification, and control. Big algos are the metaphor for surveillance capitalism in this information civilization, and they operate on the logic of accumulation. While we've been talking about grand notions, our digital experience are, at the same time, comprised of a complicated web of experiences that is hard to summarize with one theory or one tale. The questions that are closer to our lives are those like, does the recommendation algorithm of Spotify know your music taste better than you do? Does your social media profile truthfully reflect who you are? What are the boundaries between authentic and inauthentic? How do short videos influence our attention span? How do we think about tech industry in the Silicon Valley? It is from trying to offer some thoughts on these bits and pieces that I want to create the holistic reflection of our computer-mediated actions. There is no right way of thinking about them. I, myself, at least, don't have an answer. But I want to, through this piece, create a simulated, alienated environment of our online world with the taste of satire and parody to invite you all to think together with me.